Gardens and seeing her pollinator garden at Chatham Mills. So the thing to note about this is if you want to um, carpool, anyone who's, who wants to carpool or is maybe carpool curious, um, if you guys want to try and find each other over uh, in the food lab at break, that would be great. Um, so, you know, this, this is me trying to hook up carpooling for you. There will a spot where carpool and carpool curious people will be standing over there, okay, at break. That'll be a fun trip, that's exciting. And then for the last class, it is our diagnostics class and we'll also be learning a little bit about some of our committees. Also, additionally, we typically do a little bit of a potluck at the last class. Um, some of you are overachievers who are gonna make the intricate, amazing thing. Some of you, this girl, are gonna go to the grocery store. That, the whole spectrum is fine, right? Right, we are not all Margaret Lee. Um, we love that the world has Margaret Lees, but we accept that we are not all Margaret Lee. So I'll, I'll include that in your email, but just a little something to share with the group would be nice. It could be a drink, it can be a snack, it can be whatever. And so we'll kind of swan around learning how to diagnose plants, learning about committees, and eating tasty snacks. That will be our last day of class. Does that all sound good? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mark. He is our horticulture agent in Orange County. So he sees their, oversees their Master Gardener program. Absolutely phenomenal program. Uh, does everything else, too. Mark and I always seem to like get in projects for Extension Broadway together. So a lot of fun. But Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. I guess you can see that I'm probably uh, more of a tool person because I brought a lot of tools to show you guys, and I've got a lot of slides. So how much time do I have total? You have until 10:30, and then you have another hour. So you have like oh, two hours, two and a half hours. Okay, cool. Okay, I got I got a lot of stuff to talk about. So there's a lot of information out here, and I'm going to provide Ashley the two slideshows that I've got that I'm going to actually present. So, if, so you don't actually have to, to write down the links and stuff that's on there. Um, but I really enjoy coming to teach Master Gardeners because you guys really want to learn, okay? Um, there's a lot of information. I said, Ashley, what do you want me to teach? And she said, well, do the woody ornamental, woody ornamentals and loans, loan maintenance. Okay, I can do that, but that goes, it's a whole gamut of stuff. So, um, looking at the branch in front of you, can you tell me what that is? Does anybody know what it is? Okay, it's mulberry. Okay, how can you tell mulberry? Now, the, 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 neat, the, the very small leaves on it are very new, but if you look at them, they kind of look like the, they're lobes. See that? And, and mulberry usually has two different. They can have. They can take on a different shape. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to look at this other plant. And who can tell me what this is? No, it's not curly willow. It's a walking stick. Any lauders walking stick. It is. Uh, it is a hazel in the hazelnut family, okay? Um, but who can tell me why this thing is all twisted like this? It, it literally turns 90 degrees. Why, why is that? Who can tell me what causes that? It's the sunlight. Actually, the sunlight uh, influences the way it grows. So temperature and sunlight cause this, this bad boy to twist and contort. Um, I have some that's actually, it's got knots on it, and, and I'm going to show you a picture of this guy in the presentation a little, a little bit further along, but take a look at it, pass it down, and, and show your neighbor. Uh, let me take a look at it so you have an opportunity to see what, uh, see the beauty of it that's out there in nature, okay? And I'm sorry, I've got, I made your, your desk a mess here. Okay. No, it does not. It does not. So, okay, um, so um, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to, to be able to talk with you, and I'd like you guys, I got, I'd like you guys to talk back. So, so if I've got a question, I'll ask it, and then you can, can shout out the answer or whatever, okay? So, so here's a question that I want to answer at the very end of the class, okay? Are you a turner or a stirrer? Okay. Are you a turner or are you a stirrer? We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Okay. 
So, this is my yard, okay? <laughs> um, as an extension agent, I'm kind of like a painter, right? The painter never gets any love. His house never gets, gets any love. Well, I'm an extension agent. My, my yard doesn't get any love. So anyway, I've got, you can see I've got some raised beds here, and of course, I've got a couple deer. Went the wrong way. Okay. Okay, this is kind of the things we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about right plant, right place. We talk a little bit about growing conditions. Now, y'all been through this how many weeks? Fourteen. Four, so you're at twelve right now, right? So you guys should know a lot of this stuff, right? Yeah. Right plant, right place. Um, I have a funny story to tell you, and I will tell anecdotes as we go along. But uh, I was driving home yesterday uh, after picking up my son from school, and uh, I saw this tree, and I said. Something just doesn't look right. It was a beautiful magnolia Leland Cypress. What? It was a magnolia Leland Cypress. Have you ever seen one of those? No. Oh my God. This thing was, I wanted to be able to put it on my slideshow, so during the break, I'm gonna pull it up because I took a picture of it. But this, this um, beautiful magnolia, Grandiflora, probably 30, 40 feet tall, was encroached by a Leland Cypress. So it looked like it was one plant. It looked like a wall. And I couldn't believe it. Wow. Right plant, right place. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a, a brief tour about some common, interesting woody ornamentals. Uh, okay, what do you want? Um, these are some of the things that you want to talk about when, as you're as you're designing where you know where you want to plan and I think you had a class project right so your class project was to design something it was like all about their landscape so really understanding their landscape. understanding understanding your landscape but then after you understand it then you want to go and start improving it right so some things you want to do is what do you want to do with it okay what 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 if, if I want to screen off the neighborhood because I've got a busy road out you know, I want a screening line, okay? I want something that will do that. Well, if, if I put low-growing uh, grasses out there, will that meet the purpose? Probably not, okay? Um, what are the local uh, the growing conditions? And we know a little bit about our soils. Uh, we know that our, our zone is 7B here. And so what will grow here? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that. What are the growing conditions and, and uh, what's available at the local nursery? This is one of the problems that, that I run into all the time. I get a client that says, hey, you know, what do you, you know, I, I want to get this, I want to get a plant, a screening plant, and I go into the plants database. Y'all know what the plants database is, right? Okay, I go to the plants database, and I pull up a selection, it gives me five beautiful, beautiful plants. I say, well, here's your choices. And then they go and they look at those choices, and then they start calling around, and they can't find them at the local nursery. So, so then I, I look kind of foolish and say, gosh, you know, I'm sorry about that. I should have done my homework. I should have made those phone calls. I should have known or, or at least visited some nurseries or been able to give them an option of where to go to find some of those, those plants. So plants database, it's fantastic, but go that extra step if you're uh, advising a client, um, call in on the help desk or whatever, or having visited the nurseries are even better knowing what's what you've seen in person and say hey you know i can't recommend that you go to this nursery but i have seen this plant specifically at this nursery and and that's totally okay because uh, it's on your observation your personal observation okay so this is the plants database this is exactly what we were talking about so i'm glad you guys have been in it long enough to know how to use this and have you gone in here and, and you know mess with this and change the database the conditions and and select it like for example just evergreens you know you've got broadleaf evergreens and you have uh you know uh narrow leaf or or you know um what we're trying to say scaled uh, yes exactly okay so again um what going back to the purpose what are you trying to accomplish uh with your trees now as we talked about in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see those Leland Cypress, how they create a screen. And this, 
This was a plant that, that we used, you know, we've used many, many years, overused it, um, and we're still using it in the landscape. Okay, they're relatively inexpensive, um, and, and plants that, that really, really grow high, but they have a lot of problems. So when you make a recommendation, um, a couple things you need to tell your clients that we'll talk about it is about right space, right place, right space, uh, you know, for your planting. Um, and I'll show some pictures of that a little, little uh, for, for, for closer on. Okay, what's this in the upper left-hand corner? Red bud. Red bud, right? It's, why is it such a good plant to, to, as a selection plant? What's that? It's native, okay? And so what does native mean? Lower, lower maintenance, lower water requirement. It grows well here. And oh, by the way, there's a lot of cultivars out there that you can get that are, that you know, you can have a weeping red bud. I've seen one, I said, oh my God, that is gorgeous. And I'd never seen one before. Uh, and a fellow agent showed it to me, it was in her yard. I said, wow, that is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so, so a lot of selections uh, that you can get out there. So look at native plants, look at the disease resistance, look at deer resistance, okay, um, as, yes, Dan. Can natives, the answer is no. Okay. And um, natives, natives have, have, we have gotten, gotten plants that have, that have naturalized, okay? They're not native, that doesn't, that means they didn't grow here to start with. They were brought in and they have become naturalized. Okay. Like the jumping worm is another example, you know? Everybody's seen the jumping worm, right? Okay, they didn't originally come here, but they've been, been naturalized, so there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, but no, a native cannot be considered invasive. Okay, okay. yes. And cultivars of the red bud, are they as hardy as, I mean, are the cultivars all the same? No, the no, some of them, uh, they do have different characteristics. The cultivars are basically a breeding process that crosses, that crosses over. Um, and the question was, are the, the red bud cultivars um, as resistant as the nat natural. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, do you know? Um, the one place where you can see problems with the cultivars of any plant in general, and red bud, it, they have many. Any cultivar where part of it is that you have more white in the leaves, right? You're lacking chlorophyll in those portions, and so white leaves will always cause the plant to grow more slowly and will be more sensitive to sunlight. They'll be more susceptible to burn. But it's fine, they can still be beautiful. The other research that I've seen with the cultivars of red bud, red bud is that the red bud, like forest pansy or merlot that has the beautiful purple leaf, those are absolutely gorgeous, but purple is typically um, excess, what are called anthocyanins, and these are chemical defense compounds that the plants create. And so excess purple often means it's better defended against insects, and there has been research done showing that the purple leaved red buds do not get as much insect damage which means they are not as good of a host for insects eating on them, right? So, okay, let me just preface to say this, that I am a generalist, okay? I have about this much knowledge about this wide. I'm not like doctor over here. Even because of a tractor. So, okay, so thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, right plant, right plant, right uh, right place, and if you'll notice the uh, the plant under here, you think that's a right place? Probably not. Okay. Okay. Some of the things you want to think about: the light conditions. And I do a lot whenever I go out and do a home visit. Uh, people say, "Hey, I want to put a." I, w I was out in Chapel Hill. If you know much about Chapel Hill, you know it's mostly in shade. Um, and this family said, "Well, I really want to have a vegetable garden, and we planted it here last year." And we just don't think it got enough sunlight, so we're going to put it here. Um, this year, what do you think? And so I pulled out my trusty phone, and I've got this application. It's called Sun Surveyor. You may want to write this down because I don't think I have this uh, have it down anywhere. It's called Sun Surveyor. It's a, there's a free app. It's called Light. And there's also one that you pay. It's about 7 bucks. But anyway, what it allows you to do is to, in a real time, stand where you're going to plant that plant 
and you can see where where the sun is. It, it will show you the arch of the arch of the sun where it is during the day. Well, the beauty is you can go and you can tap on the bottom uh, on the timeline. You can either have a 24-hour setting or you can tap a, a specific day setting. You can change it to, to next month. You can change it to next year and look at the same track. So uh, at our building in, in Orange County, we've got a new building. On the back side of the building, I went and I took my sun surveyor and I looked at it. We have absolutely zero sun throughout the winter on the back side of the building. So it's, it's actually a shade garden in the winter, but in the summer, it gets almost full sun. So you talk about a challenge for a master gardener to, to put a plant in there, okay? It's gonna be very difficult, right? So Sun Surveyor is a great program, um, and it helps you identify light conditions. Okay, soil pH, how do you know what the soil pH is? Soil sample, soil sample. How do you know what the fertility is? Soil sample, that's right, that's right. Okay, what about the water? How do you know about water? Um, does the ground perk? How do you know that? Okay. Dig a hole? Okay, who said it? Dig a hole? Put water in it and see how fast it disappears. Okay, and how, how quick, good percolation, how, how long should that last? I mean, if I fill, that, fill a 12 inch hole, 12 inches around, how long should it be before all the water is gone? It was gone. 12 hours, or 24 hours, yeah. 24 hours, you've got pretty good drainage in that area. What can you do if you've got really terrible drainage? Raise your bed. You can raise your bed. Exactly, so that, that the gravity will pull that water out if your bed is six inches, 12 inches. And that's the reason that we do a lot of this. What about, um, what about nematodes and other problems that you have? You know, raised beds or, or even something like straw bell gardening, you know, growing in, an, in another median, right, okay? Um, containers, growing in containers is another option if you've got uh, poor drainage. Okay, um, maturity size, what does that mean? What is your question? What, what does it mean by mature size? What, that's a consideration when you're selecting a plant. So mature size, what does that mean? How big is it going to be when it's mature? Okay, okay, you go to the, you go to the nursery. I'm going to ask you a question. You go to the nursery, it says 8 to 12 feet. So how tall is that tree going to get? <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. Okay, and, and just, just, just a rule of thumb, okay, we do have dwarfism, you know, dwarf. Um, but if, if a plant is in its, its optimal growing area, it will, it will go about one and a half times the maximum height that it says. So if it says 12 feet, you can expect 18 feet, okay? What's that? Is that true for the plant so far? Or uh, uh, or uh, this is this this is for for all plants in general. They're all using it. Yep, yep. All plants in general. Um, but again, if you're talking flowers, you know, cone flowers, echinacea, whatever, you know, it says three feet. It's usually going to hold around three feet because they're annuals. So, uh, or or are they? It could be an annual. It could be a perennial. So, okay. Look at this. Right plant, right place. Okay, let me just show you. This is that, this is that uh, uh, shrub that I, we were just talking about, the twisted uh, carnuda, contorta. Okay, and then on this side, it's a it's a cryptomerium. Okay, that looks like a Christmas tree. Look how far this cryptomerium is out over the sidewalk. Okay, crazy, isn't it? And look at this, but. I'm going to show you another picture, and, and also this is a, a grandiflora, Magnolia grandiflora, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, as you notice, there's a light pole here. Okay, how much light do you think is, is getting, is doing what it needs to do? Okay, right plant, right place. This is my house, by the way. Okay. okay. Um, we, we purchased this, and I didn't want to take it out. I didn't want it, but uh, we've got plans. This guy is going away. Uh, this beautiful Japanese uh, maple blood good uh, died on us. Um, and so uh, we're, we've got a really problem because there's a pond right back here, and I've got, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> so um, anyway, I cut the light pole out so that I could get at least some penetration, uh, and then this uh, cryptoderm is going away. Okay, I'm just showing you some of the foundations. 
if you'll notice here, this is a, a giant arbor vitae, okay? And what I was trying to do is my wife loves drinking or having sips of <laughs> beverages out there. <laughs> but our next door neighbor is about 10 feet away. And so she wanted something to scream here, okay? And she wouldn't let me put anything up here. So she put a, we put a planter box in here. And we've got these, these guys are gonna get really, really big. Um, and I'm trying to get this vi these vines to come up and I'm gonna create a lattice system. So a lot of, a lot of plans are in the works, okay? Okay, we talked about the climate. We are actually in 7B. Um, and if, as you notice, the kind of the color range right in here, up in, up in this area, 7B. And so certain plants grow there. Um, has anyone ever heard of the heat zone index? Yes. Okay, well, I started doing a little exploring about the, the uh, heat index <laughs> and recognized that it's not, it's not the same. People say it's kind of the same, but it's not really the same, okay? And, and, but, but we do need to, need to start considering, um, you know, climate change, and we need to consider, you know, the heat of the summer, and the duration and the effects of what's going on with climate. But the temperate zones is based on the cold temperatures, X number of days, the t how low it gets in, in the winter, okay? Okay, microclimates. Who can tell me what a microclimate is? Okay, so a microclimate is, is in an area that has a normal climate, but it, uh, the micro, uh, the, there may be small variations in temperature changes. And what may cause that? Well, this is a real good indicator of a microclimate along the buildings because it's going to radiate heat. It's going to hold heat for longer. You can protect some plants in the winter just because you have a, it doesn't get quite as cold even 10 feet away. So it's a microclimate that is, that, is, uh, that is created by a barrier or by wind or, you know, as an example, if, you, if you've ever been by the lake and you walk down and you say, wow, it's really chilly here or wow, it's really warm down by the water. Well, that, that's a big heat sink. You know, the, the light warms it up and then it holds that heat. So that's kind of what a microclimate is. So that's kind of one of the things you want to think about, okay, as you're looking at your uh, plant designs um, and things that can cause it, of course, vegetation, you know, uh, housing, hardscapes, you know, they radiate that heat. Light exposure, okay, where does this grow? Where does this do really well? Full sun, Full sun. okay, will it do well in, in shade? Mm, it depends. <laughs> okay, it depends, and let me just tell you why. When does this guy bloom? In the springs. And when when are the leaves on the trees? Later on in the later in the spring, right? So so it will do well in shade. It's it would prefer full sun, um, and I can tell you I've got some at the house that are in almost uh, partial shade. We'll talk a little bit about light requirements here in a few minutes. But again, hydrangeas. Where, where do they prefer? They like partial. partial. They like some sunshine, but they, they would prefer shade, right? What, what is that yellow plant? Like it's Forsythia. Forsythia exintermedia. And the one below it, sorry? Uh, the other one was a grape hydrangea. Grape leaf hydrangea. It looks Yep, yep. Grape, grape leaf hydrangea. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about the taxon taxonomy of shade. Okay? So dappled. Dappled sunlight means that it doesn't get any sunlight, piercing sunlight, full sunlight, any, you know, for an hour, but it, it has light that kind of penetrates through the canopy, okay? That's called dappled, okay? Partial shade, it's, it has full sun in part of the day, and then open shade, um, um, it's, I don't know what, how I would explain open shade. <laughs> Can you help me there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't write these. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, open shade is. It's not a building, like yeah, it's, it's it, only a certain time. Exactly. It, 
Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for help for that. Right there. And then deep or dense shade, um, it's where it gets a zero zero light at all. Okay. Uh, Chapel Hill is a really good example in in the midsummer because the, the tree canopy is so tall in most of the areas down there that light just can't penetrate. It, okay. And even when it when the sun reaches across the arc, uh, at no point does it get sunlight deep. And so people look for options, and shade gardening is basically what they have to do. So, um, soil drainage, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, poorly drained standing for several days, okay? Um, so what would you do in an area if you've got this? If you've got, if you've got waterlogged soils or stuff like that, what could you do with that? Rain garden, okay? Doesn't mean you can't garden at all, okay? Don't have to fill in the swamp. And uh, funny, funny point, back at, over at our new office, um, one of the requirements that the, that the uh, builders were supposed to do was they were supposed to till in the top six inches with top soil back in, and we were supposed to have a really beautiful landscape. Well, they've done a really crappy job. Um, the, the water won't even penetrate. And so there was a hole, I went out and I said, this tree, this, this tree died, so I pulled it out, and so I left the hole there and I watched it fill up with rainwater. And three days later, it was still full of rainwater. I said, okay, that's the problem, okay? Um, our shrubs are now going like that. And I said, why is that? It's in full sun. It shouldn't do that. What do you think's happening? Those trees are actually bending because the root system are pushing them over. They can't penetrate that, that hard uh, clay uh, pan that's underneath there. Anyway, well-drained soils, um, moist soils, that's, that's one, and we talked a little bit about things you can do. You can raise a bed. You know, if you grab your soil and you squeeze it and water comes out, that's, that's not really desirable. That's, that's really waterlogged soil. Um, let's see. Uh, Xeric soil, basically, the, the water just flushes through. Um, when you plant a shrub, in sandy soil, um, how often should you water it? Never? Um, or you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. right well and, and that was kind of a loaded question it really was okay um, sandy soils usually have very big particle size and so right. water just penetrates right through um, so what in a, a strategy is if you're trying to establish a shrub uh, you need to water half as long twice as often okay in very clay soils you want to water one time or water deep okay so the water is there and the, the plant can actually get a hold of that but what happens with the same as nutrients, you know, you flush it right through, you put half the amount of nutrients and you do it twice as opposed in sandy soils compared to clay soils, because you want it, you want that, that nutrient to, to be there when the plant needs it. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, structures here about plants in a few minutes. Okay, um, pH and soil acidity. What are our soil types here? Acid. Acid. So what do we do? Acid is on the lower side. Zero to seven is, or zero to six point nine 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 is acid, right? Seven is neutral. Seven point zero one and up to fourteen is alkaline, right? So what do we do to bring our acid from a low number, four point five, to five or six or seven? Lime. Lime. Okay. What do we do to to bring our soil uh, down if we're too high? Sulfur will do that, but it's not recommended. Not in this area, okay? Um, I very rarely make a recommendation ever to add sulfur, but there are, there are a few exceptions. Um, uh, I, I, I had a, a blueberry farmer who um, was growing blueberries, and our soils in Orange County are very, very acid. So I went up there, and they weren't doing really well. They were very chlorotic. I mean, they didn't look like they, they were thriving. And um, so I, we pulled a soil sample, sent it to the lab, and he, his soil pH was like 7.4. And I said, how in the world is this even possible? Okay, 
Um, because, because what kind of pH does the blueberries like? Four, four and a half, five, they do really well there. So um, in this instance, we, we looked at you know, what would cause the pH to be so high, number one, we're looking at the root cause as opposed to uh, trying to salt, you know, just to bring the pH down. But um, ultimately, we ended up making a recommendation to dig up the shrubs, to put uh, 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 pine fines in it, to add some soil, uh, some sulfur to the, to the mix, um, and then to replant. Um, and they're doing okay, but the amount of sulfur you really have to, to do to lower his pH to where it needs to be, it's just not realistic. So uh, he's, he's now growing blackberries. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Blueberries. How many of you have blueberries at home? Have you looked at them lately? What kind are they? What, are, what, are the, what types are they? Rabbit eye, okay, and the majority of the ones in this area are rabbit eye. So if you make a recommendation and you tell somebody get high bush, you may want to think about rabbit eye because our part of the of the of the state we really need to have rabbit eye. Uh, but there's an early there's an early, medium, and late season. So based on the variety, you can have blueberries super early, June, July. Okay, you can have them mid July, August or August, September, based on your variety, okay? A lot of people don't know that, and it's all about cultivars, but they're all rabbit eye. Make sense? Okay, so, um, having said that, how many of you had freeze damage on your blue, black blueberries? How many of you had freeze damage on your blueberries this year? I did, I did, and I went out there and I said, oh my God, you know these, these it stayed warm so long in January, and in February, and, it, and everybody started run, running to the Home Depot and said, hey, I want to plant my tomatoes. <laughs> Not a good idea, right? And um, so, so this is what happened. You had all this beautiful bloom, you know, the, all this green, tender foliage, and then we had a freeze, okay? And mine were in full bloom, okay? Um, but the beauty of blueberries is they're very tolerant of cold, okay? So, um, Mine did survive. I did have a little bit of damage. Some of the blooms did freeze. Uh, and and you, they're very evident. You can see that it turned brown, little brown spots on just one side of the, of the bloom. So just as you're, as a master gardener, the power of observation is phenomenal. Okay, what's going on in my yard? I'm going to hear somebody next week on the helpline because of their experience and what I experienced this week, and they just haven't seen it yet. Okay, so the power of observation going around your own yard, seeing what's going on, going to those nurseries, seeing what's going on there. What's for sale? Powers of observation. Okay, uh, all right, azaleas, these are early bloomers. They love alkaline soils. Uh, okay, what I was gonna show you over here, river birch, okay. Um, iron chlorosis, what does that mean? Okay. Okay, I didn't bring my chart, but, but you've all seen the pH chart, right? The color bar. And what happens is when your pH is, in the, is, is wrong for a specific plant, um, it can't take up certain nutrients. And so this one, the, the river birds can't take up iron if the pH is, is not in the range. So that's kind of what this is showing. Uh, healthy leaf on top and the bottom leaf is uh, uh, kind of yellowy. Yes, ma'am. Say that's true. Yes, very, very much so. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I can just attest to the fact that I had problems with uh, a blueberry planting that I had established a long time ago. I've been doing great. It started to really just, just not thrive. It ended up being a driveway that was put in right next to it, and it, it actually drove the pH way up. Mm -hmm. uh, I Certainly. Control it with sulfur. What's that? Okay, well great, great. That, and, and when you've got small plantings, that's, yeah. you know, that's totally okay to do, but you can also go too, f too far too fast. Yeah. Um, it, it does take a, take a lot uh, of molecular activity to break it down to where it can be, you know, to change that pH. Um, and so even our agronomy labs don't recommend Home, for homeowners, for the most part, to add sulfur. But in your instance, you know, your case, it's 
well, you know, if, if it worked out for you, fantastic. Yes, ma'am. What is the recommendation if it's not sulfur? Um, there. What's your recommendation? It's well, I don't usually make a recommendation to bring pH down. Oh. Um, what I tell people is, okay, let's do some other things instead. Let's look at maybe, maybe composting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's amend the soil to make it make it healthier. You can dilute the soil in a solution because it is a solution, right? Anything that mixes together, it's a solution. So you can add more topsoil to it. Um, if it's a small planting, um, or you can raise it up a little bit so that it's not in the, the parent material. Uh, but for the most part, I don't recommend, usually recommend making big changes. Okay? All right, so. Okay. This is really hard to see. Do you see the house in the upper, upper photograph? Okay, and this is kind of what we were talking about earlier about right plant, right place right size, okay? That's a, that, the house actually goes over to about right here. Is that your house? No, that's not my, That's a good question, but this one is. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, what's going on down here? What is this? Who can tell me what that is? Can you see it? It's a crepe myrtle. We'll talk a little bit about crepe myrtle, I mean myrtle, in a little bit. Okay, again, uh, encroachment of the sidewalk. See, half, half the sidewalk is is unusable because of the shrubbery. Okay, this is the thing that I think is so fascinating. People don't quite grasp how about the root system that are under a tree. Okay, so here you hear about fertilizing, about watering, you water out to the drip line because that's where the, the natural flow of water is coming. It's hitting down here. Well, look where the feeder roots are. So if you look at from the drip line, the radius of, or the, the actual diameter of the drip line, and you go out from here, from the tree, the, the same diameter, it's twice the distance from the tree, is where your feeders are. Okay, this is the one that's taking up those nutrients that are pulling, you know, that, that, you, that fertilizer that you've been spreading all along are out there, okay? Transport roots basically are the bigger ones, okay, that are bringing the nutrients. And then the big anchor roots are here at the bottom. So when I tell people to fertilize, if you're talking about a shrub, they say, well, six inches from the shrub out to the drip line. Well, I would argue that you probably need to go from six inches a little bit further out, okay? At least so you can get into those feeder roots because that's where it's gonna be making moisture and making you know, the food and so forth out there. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's, it's kind of, kind of. I mean, I, I, I use drip line to, you know, double the drip line. Yeah. So, anyway. But to me, I think this is a really fascinating. Uh, and remember I told you our trees are pushing over? Well, it's these anchor roots right here on our trees that are causing them to push over. Okay. <laughs> Growth form. What does that mean? When you consider to buy a plant, you want to consider the growth habit, right? Or the growth form. Okay, and these are just some of the some of the shapes you can look at. And, and by, by making it black and white, you can really kind of stand out and say, oh, wow, you know, that, that really makes, makes sense. Like uh, the pencil, what's it called? Pencil, um, boxwood, pencil boxwood. Yeah, it's kind of like the pencil boxwood. Okay, columnar. You know, depends on what you're after in, in your landscape and what forms you're trying to fill. Okay, um, these are a couple, we already talked about the plants, database, and then going native. If you're looking for native plants, this is a great uh, link to go to uh, to help, help find, find plant, plants or find out about plants that are more native, okay, and again, this will be up to keep you these slides and you can distribute them freely distribute them. Okay, when you go out to purchase plants, how many of you have ever tapped the bottom of a plant and pulled it out and looked at the root system? Anybody? Before buying it? Before buying it, absolutely. Oh my gosh. I do it all the time. I just, I, I rip that cover off, I tap it, and I pull that sleeve off and I look at the roots. If I see something, it looks like this. Do you think I'm going to buy the plant? Okay, what's that called? 
It's root bound. Okay? It, it, what's happening is the plant is going round in circles. The roots, they hit the edge of the bucket. Uh, and then they start doing this. Okay? Here you can see that this root is actually girdling. It's cutting off the bottom half of the plant. So where are the nutrients going? They're not getting up to where they need to be. Um, I saw a tree, a Japanese maple this week where the lady didn't take off the little band at the top and the top half of her Japanese maple was just dead. It had a collar about that, that wide. And I said, you know, th the funny thing is, I mean, you recognize it and she was one of my master gardeners and she didn't realize it was on there. So she had just captured just caught it like two days earlier over the weekend. And I said, well, why do you have this stake on here? And she said, well, my husband put that there when we first planted it. And I said, you know, the, the stake itself is rotten at the bottom. It's not doing anything, and you still have these other two bands that you're potentially girdling it with. And so she was just really apologetic and kind of embarrassed. But that's how you learn. That's how you learn is you make mistakes and you, you move on, okay? So, this is kind of how we grow, containers, ball and burlap, and then bare root. So when do you think you're gonna, gonna find bare root plants? Winter. Winter, and why is that? Because, because that's the best time to plant. That's, that's the best time to plant, and, and by the way, there's a reason for doing that. Um, these, these places, these nurseries that grow these plants, they can't ship soil with these plants. So they, 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 they dig them up, they get the bare roots, and they spray them off. But the only time they can do that is when they're dormant. The plants have to be dormant, okay, uh, before they'll ship them. So sometimes what they'll do is they'll take the bulb, bulb they'll put sawdust with it, so you think you got soil, but it's not. It's sawdust. So shake it off, get it in some good uh, growing medium, and, and, and get it planted immediately. Okay, bald and burlap, when can, you, when can you plant it? Spring or fall is the best time. Um, I would argue that you could probably, well, the book answer is you can plant them anytime as long as you properly water them and tend to them, okay? Same for container plants. You can do it at any time, but however, there's a better time, a best time, and then a not advised time, <laughs> okay? Does that make sense? Okay, um, again, some of the common problems, um, you know, in, when they do the container plants, they look really good. They water them every day. They fertilize them, you know, once a week. Uh, so when you get them home, we don't baby them like that. We get them out of the pot and we plant them. So I'm gonna, I think I've got some pictures of that, how to plant, properly plant. Okay, have y'all talked about planting a plant? They just took a quiz on it and we talked about it a little bit, but we can always do more. Okay, I'm gonna tell you, um, from, a, from a, an extension agent perspective, our Master Gardener program, uh, we had a project. We always do a project. So the students are required to design a, a space. And then after the class, then we actually try to execute parts, parts of the whole, okay? And so we did this, this uh, garden at the courthouse. And so when we came out to, to have our work day, one of the things I realized is that, you know, we never really taught the Master Gardeners how to properly plant a plant uh, and I, I was just I was kind of embarrassed because <laughs> you know that's that's you 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 make an assumption um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about it. so if you're going to do a ball burlap or you know a potty plant you want this hole to be twice as wide as this ball okay and you can kind of see that it's twice as wide and then it's only as deep as the surface where the surface is supposed to be and Barber Fair is, is North Carolina uh, Cooperative Extension tree expert. She's got some fabulous videos, and I'm going to tell you where to go to find those. And uh, if I've got time, I'll demonstrate that, but um, for right now, go, if you go to the, R, the, the Master Gardener electronic version, at the very bottom of Chapter 11, it talks about, uh, you know, woody ornamentals. It talks about videos. It says, uh, you know, video links about how to prune a tree, okay, or how to, how to plant a tree. Click on there. It's there are two three-minute videos. It will show you how to plant, a plant, uh, plant one of these. 
and, and how to find the, the first main root, because that's really what you're supposed to look for, and that's supposed to be where the level of this soil line is. Sorry about that. Okay, Barbara Fair. F A I R E. Yeah. Yes, Dave. Do you have room to grow that? Okay, that's a good question. Um, it depends on how big it is uh, and what the ball composition is. Um, when I do it, if I, there's usually a metal cage there as well. Um, they put it in a metal cage. You want to cut off half the cage. You want to want to take all the string because the string is usually uh, plastic. You want to take all that string off, and then you want to pull the burlap down and if I, and cut it if you can't get it out of the cage. You cut, cut the burlap. What you don't want is you don't want any of that burlap above the ground level. Because what happens, uh, the, the roots will penetrate it. And so what I do is I'll try to score it. If I can't remove it, I'll score holes in the burlap so that the, that the roots will, will penetrate it. Um, but what will happen is that if that burlap is above the ground, it'll wick away the moisture, okay? So, so that's why you want to cut the burlap off if you can. Um, sir? Yeah, uh, so our, our handbook says that when you fill the soil with that thing, you should not pull it down because it may affect it. Uh, uh, okay, there's a difference. Are you on the watering to infill all the air space? There's a difference. There's a difference between compaction and stepping it in, okay? I will tell you that, that I've never had a problem with a tree by physically stepping all the way around um, and getting the soil in. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to force that, those air pockets out. Right. So you, I step it down. You know, you, I'm, not, I'm not really cramming it in, but I'm stepping it down. I'll get about halfway, half, half full of soil, step it down. I'll put water in it, get it nice and saturated. It, it, it uh, really helps that, make sure I've got water below the tree ball. And then I'll put soil on top and I'll water it again. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you step on it again, right? I'm sorry? Do you step on it again? I do, it? yeah. Well, I, but when, it depends on how wet it is. It's before I water it. The second time I will step it down again. I do, just to make sure I've got good, uh, good soil contact. Because I don't want to have any, any air pockets in there. So are you saying it's okay to leave the metal, metal cage? Yes, half of it. You want to cut, cut. With bolt cutters, just cut the cage off. Which half? I mean, Why? explain the half. That okay. You've got a cage that it usually comes at. Um, okay. Okay, imagine this is a metal cage. Yes. Okay. Uh, the tree is in it, it's got bald and burlap. Uh, either the, the burlap could be on the outside of the cage or it could be on the inside of the cage. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove all the string twine and stuff like that. If it's sandy soil, I'll usually leave the burlap on it. If it's clay, I usually I'll lift it up and slide the burlap off of it. So with and it depends again how big it is. I'll cut the cage all the way around like this, and then I'll slice it so that it only has the bottom half of the cage. Does that make sense? You you can do that. You could do that, but again, I prefer not having it there at all. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What did you say the reason for leaving the bottom half of the cage is? Because you just, it's just too, the, the tree's just too daggum heavy. <laughs> I'm talking, you know, if you've got a ball this big around, you know, and you don't have special lift equipment, it's just too heavy. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's that's the biggest point, is right, you would remove all of it, but a ball and burlap is a big, heavy thing that you're not going to get under it at that point. So remove as much as you physically can, yeah. and like compromise on the and, and the roots will penetrate. I mean, it's a cage, so that's what they're really, it won't hurt it, okay? But personally, I, I would remove it if I could, but you can't always do that. Yes, ma'am. I saw in your previous slide, you were showing a, uh, a plant that you were, a shrub or a tree, that maybe is on a slope or something. Mm -hmm. And so the front half, of course, is not going to be suitably. Right, right, right. Okay, yep. Yeah. And so and what you. Well, the issue is you, it's got you got it's got to be deep enough to get that to, to make sure you've got that that flush and you want it and you want your tree to be your shrub to be straight up and down. You don't want it to be leaning 
either way, because otherwise you'll have everything leaning away from the hill as opposed to, so you, you, you straighten it as best you can and to leave half of it out is okay, um, but you don't want to have any burlap. Don't show any burlap whatsoever and you can make sure you've got soil on top of those root systems because the roots, they don't like fresh air, okay? Um, and what happens is the, the, the physiology of how plants grow, um, I think I've got a grow bag here somewhere. The physiology of these things are phenomenal, okay? And what happens is, is you fill this thing with soil and you got your plant in the middle of it and it grows. And what happens is as the roots actually get to the edge uh, of this plant, because this is fibrous, air is penetrating. The, the roots will actually slow down as it gets closer to the edge of these fabric bags. So you, and, and these also act as a wick as well, so you gotta add a lot more water. Yes, ma'am? Can you get the green mossy stuff on the outside of that? Uh-huh. No, 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 it's algae. All it is is algae. Okay. You know, if you, <laughs> um, don't put anything on that algae to kill it. <laughs> Normally, something like copper would do that, but roots don't like copper. <laughs> and it'll kill the roots on the outside as well. So I'm going to continue on. I'll show you some more pictures of uh, planting a tree. Okay, look how fibrous this is. Can you see this? Okay. Um, if I run into a situation like this where I will literally cut this, you know, I'll cut an inch of the very, very bottom off where it's been next to the plastic. Okay. And then I take my knife and I literally score it all the way around, just cutting all the way down from top to bottom, just about two, every two inches, just cut it, okay? And what that does, every time you cut, when you prune, it releases an endorphin, yeah. the plant, and it tells the plant, hey, I've been damaged, I need to grow. <laughs> so when I cut this bottom off, it tells that plant, hey, time to grow, okay? Um, I've been damaged. So you're actually doing root pruning when you do this and you plant, plant the plant. I, well, I, I just use, a, mine is nothing but a, a case, a box cutter. So, so it's only, you know, that deep. I just score it all the way down, all the way around. Yes, ma'am. So if you're planting and there is a big tree over there, okay. and you've got feeder roots mm -hmm. out of here, um, what do you do not to disrupt the feeder roots? Oh, I, I cut right through them. You can. Yeah. <laughs> It's that, that little little area where you're planting, you're not going to hurt it. If it's a big tree, you're not going to hurt it. And how big of roots do you feel comfortable? I mean, I take some anchor roots. I, I don't have any heartburn. And I'm going to show you some tools here that I use whenever I do landscaping work. Yes, ma'am. It's hard to tell, it really is. Um, I've, I've had quite a few calls. Uh, we just put in a new, uh, a, we've added an extension on our house. The, land, the guy came in and he cut the root system and you know, half his tree is dead because he's done that, you know, because they, they cut into the anchor roots, they were less than 10 feet away and they just, you know, so that kind of thing. And so my recommendation is take the tree down. You know, get it down. Don't let it become a problem and fall on your house. It's a safety issue there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So I just want to understand when um, my frog thing is closed. So I can about planting here. Yeah. Is it on a slope? So the back side of the tree is going to get. You may have to climb a little bit deeper. So referring to is okay imagine you have a slope like this yeah. okay and this is this is the bucket yeah. okay I'm gonna try to get you know the back side is gonna be of the soil line is gonna be here right. so it's gonna be almost into the into the hill yeah. the front side it's gonna be this part gonna have a quarter of the it's not That's under right. and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mound soil up here on the lower side because I want this to be in the ground flush so that it's growing straight up. So now would you cover well this whole thing about if the roots are exposed to the air too long let's just say you have the appropriate size the appropriate depth and a lot of things say plant so that the root ball is right at the level of the soil. Mm -hmm. Isn't that Well, the mulch, they have a whole other thing. I mean, you don't want them 
mulch is always, when I plant, yep. I, I will always plant, I will have soil all the way around that root ball. Yep. Okay, and then all the way to the top of that root ball, yep. it will have soil. Yep. Okay, even if I have to create a, a you know, a collar yep. of soil so that it, so there's no air directly on that root ball. But not soil on the top. No, no, no. no. But when you, when you put the mulch. And then I mulch. And do you mulch up to the base? Because there's a whole lot of things about well, that. Well, we'll talk about that. You, what do you think? You don't, up to about two inches from the actual stem That's of, of the trunk. Yeah. You don't ever want the soil, the mulch, directly in contact with that, the main trunk. And there's something called a flare, yeah. the, the tree flare. Um, that flare requires oxygen, air, atmospheric air, so that it, it, it won't disease, you won't have uh, voles and stuff creating, right. you know, creating problems and chewing, chewing that lower bark level. Okay, so you're going to get this. Would you say that applies pretty much straight across the board to any kind of plant? Yes, ma'am. That's what I thought. Yes, ma'am. But I have I would one always saying, you, know, you want to go right up to the base. Of well, the watch the video. Watch the, the video. Well, from I've learned that the whole thing about bowls is an upgrade. Well, exactly. But uh, I'm saying, watch that video that's uh, from Barbara, Barbara Fair. And she's going to tell you to actually plant it a little bit higher. A little bit low, uh, higher up, so this is not really the soil line. It's actually a little bit lower, okay? Um, and she's going to tell you how to use a, uh, you know, use a, a a point, you know, to find where that that first root is, okay? And then that's the layer that the, the soil needs to come to, okay? But if you if you're planning on slow, don't worry about it. It will it will work itself out. The shrub won't know it's on the slow. Okay. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. Yeah, okay. But the whole mulching thing is... The mulch is, is absolutely, positively yeah. the, one of the best things you can do. Yeah, and the video is... Uh, Barbara Fair's uh, How to Plant a Tree, I think. It's okay. chapter 11, the very bottom, the electronic version. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, uh, planting uh, grafted trees. Okay. I graft grafted above. Trees. Graft above. Yeah. Right. In any particular distance or any distance? It needs, it's got to be above, okay? And usually, usually the soil level will, you know, wherever, whenever it comes in, the graft will probably be that much higher than the soil line. So if, you, if you're using the soil line for a graft, as here, yeah. okay, then st stick with the soil line. Right, so assuming it's been uh, partially uh, grown out yep. and the soil line that came after the right? Correct, yeah. correct. So I saw another question. Yeah, it was a belt smoke question again. Okay. I've seen some landscape how domes or rocks up against the, the edge. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. I yeah. have use soil. It, use soil. It, even if you have to go buy soil, you know, bag soil, get soil up next to that root ball. What about the erosion factor? Won't that continue to it, it will, but once you get when you get mulch on it, that trees once it gets established, you won't have a problem. I just, just where it looks, where it yeah, looks decent. Right. I mean, don't, yeah. it's not rocket science. It's not, it's not a trough. This is me talking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Ashley. I love you, girl. Okay, um, this is one of the things that you can do. Again, um, they're spaying it out, you know, trying to break up that, that so that the roots have a better chance. But again, this is a bald burlap, you can see where the bowl was. So I have a question. Is okay. there a better with the bare bowl and a bare burlap in a container? Is there a better choice of those? It depends on the time of year and what you're after. Because Frank, the question was, is there a better using either bare root, ball burlap, or container? Containers are the hardest, okay? And the reason because they nurse them so well that you're never going to create that environment. At home, okay. The bald burlap are are more hardy. They've got a ball there. Their roots are established. They've been pruned. Um, they're really good. Uh, and you stake them in. You get them in. You get them established. They do really good. The bare root to me is the best. 
um, if, if I have a choice of the three, because I'm gonna plant it very specific. As soon as I get it in, I know it's fresh. I'm gonna stick it in the ground within 24 hours. Um, I'm gonna plant it, and it's basically, this is, a, this is bare root, okay? I'm gonna spread the roots out, and then I'm gonna stake it. And so that's a big mistake that a lot of master gardeners run into is, is staking. Um, they leave the stakes on too long, like I was explaining uh, earlier. Um, when you have a, a whip like this, are usually about this tall above the ground. So if you want a big tree, you're not gonna get a big tree that's bare root. Just not gonna happen. You're gonna get a whip, okay? Um, so anyway, you put one stake in it, you know, here, and you leave it on for about a month, so that, and then you take the stake away, okay? Because why is that? Because if, if you're given a crutch, you're gonna depend on that crutch every day until somebody takes it away, okay? But that crutch, that's what this, okay, allows the tree to, 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 to move and, and blow with the wind. It makes it more re resilient, okay? It, it's more healthy by doing that. So I tell people take the stake away as soon as possible, so about a month, okay? What if you have a tree that's been in the ground about a year that's been built or something, and now you're noticing that that little tree is starting to come Okay, look at the sunshine. If Look at the sun. If it's if it's sunlight, then you, you may want to pull it out and move it to a different location. Um, if it's like ours in Hillsboro, the roots, the anchor roots, are actually causing it to push over. Uh, they're like being root bound. Um, you could dig it up and then look at the root system and do some root pruning. Um, you know, literally cut some of those. If if that's what the problem is, is cut those those roots that are pushing it over, um, and, and and try to get a better root system. Uh, root pruning is also a way of really making fibrous roots. Um, and I didn't bring my shovel. I've got a root pruning shovel. It has a, a blade about that long. It's real narrow, and it's got a steel shank on it. And what you do is you just go at 45 degree angle all the way around about er and skip every two inches and just prune in all the way around it. It does two things. It aerates it. And remember those endorphins. That plant will, it will stimulate the growth of the root system just by simply pruning it. And you don't move it, you just go around and you prune it. Okay? And so I was, that, hoping, I was hoping you'd say, dig it and pull it back. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's the worst thing you could do. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, and this is where, where we're telling you don't step on it. You can step it in, but you know, you're not really. Um, I do have a tool I didn't bring in, but it's a tamper. I would not use a tamper to tamp it down, but I, I would step it on, step on it. Okay, this is kind of what it's supposed to look like when, when you plant it. You can see the, the ground level down here, and they created like a volcano of soil. What is that for? Water. It's a cup. Yeah. Okay, so when you water it, because you're going to have to water it for the first year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, periodically, um, and so that's that's what you're, sorry about that, um, and then you're going to mulch, you're going to put some mulch on that as well. Okay, talking about mulch, mulch volcanoes, okay, this is the big no-no, okay, what it should look like is kind of an inverted V, okay, where the soil in the middle, it's not actually touching the main trunk, it's tapered outward, and so you've got a collar about two inches out at the extreme, um, and the best thing you can do is if you, if you can afford it, depends on where you get your mulch, um, out to the tree, the drip line, okay? Remember where the feet are roots. Remember they're out here, right? Okay, but why do we mulch? It holds moisture. What else? Keeps weeds down. Keeps weeds down. What else? It keeps that, that long guy away from the tree because if he doesn't have to come up to, to weed eat, Okay, and what girdles a tree faster? It's that string trimmer, right? Yeah. Okay, so that's really what you're trying to do is to hold that moisture in that soil there um, and keep the weeds away. And uh, that, that microclimate, especially in the summer, it cools the tree. Okay, you don't think about that. It's the heat, you know, if it's on bare ground, the sun can just literally bake it. Okay, here's different uh, staking options. Okay. Single, this is kind of the width we were talking about. We have two. I'm going to show you a different one here um, that they're showing with bald and burlap. <clears throat> the only thing 
thing the stakes are, are, are designed to do is to prevent the daggum tree from blowing over until, until it, it's uh, established enough that it doesn't need the stakes, okay? Okay. Um, I think I've got a picture. I, I hope I do. Okay, um, tree wraps. Who's ever seen tree wraps? How many of you use tree wraps? Okay, good. Fantastic. Tree wraps are not normally necessary unless you have a problem with, with voles or deer um, that want to, to come up and rub. You know, that's are they about actually the, effective for the deer? What's that? Are they actually effective for the deer? It, it depends. Um, I will tell you that I've, I've got a client who, who grows um, chestnuts. And the deer absolutely love rubbing on his, his chestnut trees. And so they've got, they call them uh, uh, some, some of the tubes. Um, they're, they're, what were they called? It's, a, it's basically, it's two halves of a pipe that he puts against them. Um, the problem is that when you use things like this or the tubes, um, it creates another, a microclimate inside. And so the trees don't, no, don't completely go dormant. And so in the winter, when they have a really hard freeze, you lose the tree. So that can be a, a detriment. Um, also, the tree wraps, if you've got things like peaches um, and you're using uh, um, herbicides around the trees, uh, it helps protect the tree, the bark, because the basil bark itself can actually be, be poisoned by an herbicide if you spray it on it. So that's, that's another use for the two. Okay, avoid stakes. Stakes don't really have, have, have shown that they are not really effective, so, so stay away from that. Um, yeah, before planting is the best time to incorporate lime if you know that you're going to need to make some amendments, is always do it before. Uh, and then stir it, mix your, uh, and, and they say, they recommend that you don't actually fertilize when you plant. You want to wait a month after because you're wanting, you're wanting the, the plant to actually settle in to start searching for nutrients before you actually just throw the nutrients to it. So you can amend the soil a little bit with compost. It has very little NPK. Um, but then at the, after you've done that, you don't want to just throw a lot of fertilizer around. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I love it. <laughs> is that a good thing in your opinion? Um, well, I absolutely love it because I know I know that it's a soil. Um, it's the the soil web is it's all about soil web and what's growing under there. That because the the plants don't take up the nutrients. Say, oh, there's some nitrogen. I'm going to take up this nitrogen. I'm going to take up this phosphorus. I'm going to take up this potassium or the sulfur. What happens is it's, it's a relationship by the mycorrhizae that bring it into that. So yes, I, I say feed the soil, the soil will feed the plant, okay? Uh, oh, can we go back? Uh, slow release fertilizer is usually best if you're gonna do that. Um, organic is even better, and why I say organic, you can really just slap it, you know, accidentally throw it to an organic, uh, and it's a slow release. It's automatically slow release because it's organic. Um, and so it will feed the soil even if you accidentally over fertilize. If you fertilize using a commercial blend of say balance 20, 20, 20, uh, those nutrients are, are quick action and will actually feed the plant. You'll have a spike in growth. Um, when you're using organic, it doesn't, it's, it's slower to respond, but it will respond much longer over a balanced period. Can I just ask you? Yes, ma'am. Um, did you say when you're planting the trees, you just backfill with the soil that's around it, that you, know, you don't put in organic material? I personally, I add organic compost. If I've got compost, I'm going to amend the soil, especially if I'm in hard clay, yeah. because it's, it's, I need to, to break it up in that soil. Uh, it's just too tightly bound, so I personally would would amend it, um, but s not everybody sees it that way. <laughs> so, so just understand this is my personal uh, opinion. I personally do it if I've got it available, especially in clay. What percentage? Uh, twenty five percent. Yeah, I, I I throw you know a little bit shovel full, and then stir it in really good, and then maybe a shovel full of two. Yeah. Okay, yes, ma'am. So I want to go back to watering just for a sec. So with a bare root tree, um, I was reading in the, in the chapter that it said to soak them in water for... It depends.
tunes. It depends on what kind they are, and usually you, it will come with a label telling you how to plant it. Follow that label. Some plants, they, they recommend uh, a 24-hour soak period. Uh, others don't. It depends on where you get your trees from. Well, it, it depends on what they are. And, and again, an, another uh, live stakes, like doing stream beds, they always soak them. Um, that's just another. So follow the label. Can I make another one? Sure, comment? please. Just, uh, if some of you plan with Keith Durham Beautiful, you'll see this. Um, there's also something to think about, and Barb Fair is a real expert on this, where she talks about there's like your absolute best case scenario. There's what you actually do when you're at home because you're kind of tired. <laughs> There's what you do when you're on a crew that's planting a hundred of them, uh, right? And like those processes will change and Keith Durham Beautiful is moving so fast and planting so many that they would rather not take some of that time to do some of that work because they know, okay, well that's going to take me 20% more time, but I'm only going to get 10% more effectiveness, right? Like I'm only going to get 10% less loss, right? And so they're doing that balance. And so it's something to keep in mind even when you watch landscapers or anyone else. Sometimes they could be doing a better job, but sometimes they've just figured out where their point is for more labor would not get me yeah. a, a significantly better outcome, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit faster. I'm, I'm only like a third of the way through the course presentation, so I'm gonna start picking it up because I wanna show you my tools. I love my tools, okay. All right, deficiency, fertilizer deficiencies, okay. Uh, you can see how it's, uh, uh, just notice how the very tips, the new growth are really green and the lower, uh, with nitrogen, it, it translocates in the, in the plant. So it will go to the newer growth because the new growth need it more. And so if you see lower, you know, lower leaves are yellow and the upper, then it's probably the nitrogen deficiency. Okay. Uh, we've already talked about watering. How much water do you need for a plant a week? One inch. one inch, okay. It could be one and a half in the heat of the summer. It could be three quarters. Depends on what the water conditions are. Okay, what's happening here? Okay, you see how the, the plant is, is kind of retracting back in? Even from the back, you all be able to see that, right? So what's happening is the, the, the nutrients are not getting to where it needs to go, and it's trying to protect itself. And so it's, it's cutting its, its appendages off just not letting it grow, okay? But that's a root problem. Okay, here's another example. Okay, and what we would call these are, are water sprouts. Um, and you were, at, you were talking about grafted trees. If you ever get a water sprout or a grafted tree, don't think, well, it's two feet away from the tree that I will have a beautiful cherry <laughs> if, I, if I cut the root off and I transplant that. Because what happens is they use crappy um, rootstock, but the rootstock may be really resilient to phytophthora root rot or something like that. So they use crappy rootstock and they put a really nice apple on the top of it, okay, and it grows beautiful apples. But if you try to grow the rootstock from the rootstock, if it's grafted, it won't come out as the original. Okay, what's going on here? Yeah, this, you know what this is, right? Craig Myrtle, right? Okay, um, if you'll notice, this limb was actually, it was actually crossing over and it grew into each other. So what you've got is, is sprouts there coming up. Okay, this is the way it's supposed to look, but as you'll see, this needs, to, needs a little bit. Of, here's where the, the stump head is, where it was actually a cut across there. Okay, remember that crypt, uh, cryptomerium that we looked at, the big, too big? If you cut back, too far. If you cut past the green, okay, it will never regenerate. And so that's really what I was showing here. You can see there's a little bit of green here, but back in here, if you cut all the way back to here, you won't get any, any new growth back in here. So there's a big hole in that tree right now, so that light pole can show the light, okay? <laughs> okay, again, this is the cryptomerium, uh, and again, I'm so forward looking to get rid of this. Uh, I had my shoulder replaced uh, two months ago, and so I just haven't been able to do anything out in the yard, so I'm just getting getting strong enough to be able to do that now. Okay, that, 
Uh, do you remember that um, Magnolia that we, we looked at earlier? Okay, you see all these holes here? Yeah. Does that mean that, that there's bugs in this tree? Sapsuckers. No, who said no? Why? Sapsuckers, what is a sapsucker? Okay, it's, it's, it's a, in the woodpecker family, right? And so what does it do? And why? Why? It's after the sap. The sap is its nutrients. It comes back and creates a well. It's called a sap well. Uh, the bird flies back and it, it will revisit the tree and revisit and drink the, drink the sap. It also attracts insects, so it's a form of, of nutrient for the sap sucker. Um, but it won't, it won't necessarily kill the tree. And it, and it is not indicative that you have insects in the tree. Okay, um, but if you'll notice, big hole down here, and you see the water sprouts here, okay? So this tree is damaged, um, it's trying to protect itself. And these are those sprouts, trying to transplant them. Okay, we sold, matter of fact, I sold those at, at our last plant sale. <laughs> okay, uh, why do we prune? Structure, so aesthetics, what else? Get rid of leaves? Dead, dead disease. Disease, okay. Dead. Okay, how many of you listen to The Weekend Gardener? You ever li listen to The Weekend Gardener? Um, did you hear Johnny Coley? He's from Person County this past Saturday. He's got uh, the five Ds, dead, dying, disease, damaged, and deranged. <laughs> I'd say, that's pretty daggum clever. Deranged, okay. So anyway, um, so, you can prune dead and dying and diseased anytime, okay? Any time of year, if it's, if it's diseased and, and it's gonna, it's gonna interfere with the rest of the plant, you, you take it out. Um, if, it, if it's just deranged, it means just aesthetically not pleasing, there are certain times of year that you wanna prune, okay? Uh, for safety, anytime that there's a safety issue, you wanna prune it. And I got a phone call, and this lady says, you know, I've got a problem with my fig. And I said, what's wrong with it? She said, well, it's really big. And I said, well, <laughs> she said, can I prune it? And it was in the middle of the summer. And she wanted me to say no. And so I said, well, tell me more about it. And she said, she said well, there's a, there's a, a bus stop on the other side, and um, you can't see when you're backing out of the driveway. And I said, cut it, cut it now. If it's a safety hazard, go ahead and cut it, okay? Don't, you know, hands down, if the tree's gonna fall in your house, but you just wanna save it for another season, cut it now, okay? You know, safety, right? Um, and you really won't have that problem if, you know, if you put the right plant, right place, okay? Looking at the habit, what kind of habit is this? It's kind of a, a tapered, tapered up, right? Um, but, it's, but if you'll notice, it's multi-stem, right? And so how would I go about pruning something like this? Okay, this is a, a, an abelia. I think this is an abelia. Take out some of the markers. So go all the way to the ground. You cut out, and, you, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to open up, open up the top. So you'll go in, and the first thing I do is whenever I look at this, is anything about the size of, of, a, of a dish pan. That's, that's the footprint I want to have. So anything outside that footprint, I'll cut that away, okay? And then I'll go in and selectively thin out some of these all the way at the ground level, uh, and then I'll pull those out. It gives a lot more air circulating, so. Okay, I'm gonna give you this, uh, the Orange Gardener. The, our Master Gardeners have put together this website. It's, it's all one word, theorangegardener.org. But on there, if you click on the ornamentals or you click on lawn or, you know, there's, it's got monthly tips on what you want to do. Um, it's a really great place to go, fact finding, you know, what do I want to do this month in terms of pruning or whatever. Okay, crotch angles are where the, the different limbs come together, okay? And you can see the angles on your shrub in front of you, or the, the mulberry in front of you. But I want you to look at this one. There's two main trunks here. So what should have happened with this tree 
years and years and years ago. <laughs> one of those, one of those should have gone. They should have made a single, single trunk, uh, but they didn't. So right here, it's got a very, very weak crotch angle. Um, this happens to be in my backyard itself. <laughs> <laughs> but you um, didn't plan it, right? But I didn't plan it. I moved into the house. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you a couple more, but I want you just to look at the angle. See, they're almost side by side. That's a very, very weak crotch angle, and something should have been done. I'm gonna show you a couple more that, that actually I've done something about. Okay, look at this. This is a beach elm, okay? Look how they're going almost straight up, okay? This is in my backyard, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't have to go for it to take these pictures. Okay, so when you start talking about pruning, um, there's a couple things you want. There's different types of pruning. Um, some of them are to remove, you know, to, to, to open it up, to spread. Um, and so there's different techniques that, that you want to look at when you, when you begin pruning. There's heading cuts. Basically, this would be a heading cut, just whacking off the top, okay? Okay, like this. That looks pretty bad. Um, where a heading cut, usually would be done on things like boxwoods that have a really small, narrow leaf, and you're just gonna take pruning pruners and just go across the top and just shape it. So, so that's kind of what this is showing right here. But pruning cut, uh, the, the heading cuts are not typically used. Okay, um, there's a reduction cut. And then this is what, this, this is a reduction cut. Where we're, we're moving a big branch, okay? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to direct the energy of this tree <laughs> out this branch here. So, so look at the type. Um, this would be an example of that, okay? Another example. But see what's happening here? Yeah. Okay, and each tree, each tree is a little bit different. Okay, so the heading cut, this is an example of the heading cut. After the first year you cut it, and then what happens, that, here's the cut, and if you'll notice this stem right here is growing here, and it's got new growth. See this little, I guess that's from this bud back here. Uh, and then you've got this small bud right here, it's, it's growing this. And then this is a thinning cut. Look at the size, the size diameter, and the majority of the energy is going this direction here. Okay, and then you have a little bud back here. So this is an example. This is a uh, an ornamental. No. This is an, an oriental persimmon. That's what it is. Oriental persimmon. Uh, and so they have different pruning techniques. And and you've heard of like peaches. You know, a peach tree. It looks like a bowl. It's an open center. So basically, what happens is you get the scaffolding and you cut the main leader, and so it opens it up, and then every, then the sunlight penetrates. The bowl, right? And so all the peaches grow on the outside, and you come around and you just pick them and, and eat them. But with the persimmons, uh, what I wanted to do is to create a something called a modified open center. So this had a really bad crotch angle down here, and so I literally cut the cut the main one off, okay? And then I'm creating scaffolding here and here, and then this is the main leader. So what will happen is is I'm going to go this year and I'll cut it and create another scaffolding system like this a little bit further up. That's called a modified <laughs> open center. So you'll cut the main leader down the road. Yeah, I cut the main leader here already. Right, okay. Okay, you can see yeah. where the, the scar was. Okay, okay. That's okay. And this is what, what shot up. But okay. the new main leader. The new main leader. What are you going to do with that? I'm going to, I'm going to cut it. I'm going to create a section about that far up. And I'll cut it again and do the same thing that I did here. You'll cut it higher up. Though. That's correct. So it'll have a, it's called modified open center. Yeah. So the center kind of was open, and then it'll go up, and then it'll be open again. And, then and so what will happen is it'll have four branches, and then each one of those. And so what I'm trying to do <laughs> is to create open centers in different areas of the tree so that I'll have persimmons all around. Um, this is not, it's not bearing fruit yet, uh, but it well, will be. let us know. Okay. Uh, we, have, we have one at the office. Oh, my God, you wouldn't believe how many persimmons it put on this year. Really? It must have put about 40 persimmons on. 
you have big baseball size, gorgeous, gorgeous, made great for sitting pudding. Wow. Okay, um, rejuvenation cut. Basically what you're doing is you're just whacking it off at the ground level, okay? Blueberries do really well for rejuvenation like that. You know, you can literally almost mold them down. Uh, figs do well, total rejuvenation. If it gets too big, just go ahead and whack it off. Really? Yes. Even really tall ones, I just cut mine way down. Yep. And the best time? Yep, winter, in the winter. Meaning December to? <laughs> to January. <laughs> this past year, <laughs> December. <laughs> okay. okay, but um, one of the things, a gradual rejuvenation is you take a third off. There's different techniques. You can take a third off. No more, whenever you do pruning, the kind of the rule of thumb is you never take more than a third off. Okay, even with grass, no more than a third. So um, you can also do a... I'm sorry, did you repeat that? You said never a third. Ne never take more than a third. Anytime you prune, never you take... You said we could whack it down. Well... As that's a, this is total rejuvenation. This is totally different. Okay, so normally rule of thumb is you you never take more than a, a third of it off. Okay, um, you can do it in stages. For example, in crepe myrtle, what you do is you take the main trunk, take a big you know take a take a section out. Okay, and then go over here and take a section out. Don't take you know don't whack the whole thing down and, and do what they call crepe murder right that's kind of what crepe murder is, murder is so if you go and you take a whole if you take a whole trunk out that's different than than just going out and pulling the top and I'll, i've got some pictures of that pulling here in a few minutes okay again landscape out of control this is the front of my house um but but i wanted to draw attention these are uh, buford hollies and They've got two, two trunks. And so what I'm going to do this year, now that I can saw, um, they have two trunks. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to cut one of these trunks off down here. And we'll take half the shrub off. And then I've got one on the other side that's also split. So I'm going to take, ha take that all the way down just below, below the brick line. See, I've got a really high porch, but I don't want to show all this brickwork. So I'm going to take, take this down to about right there. And, and what will happen is it will produce new sprouts, new shoots, uh, and then next year, I'll come back and I'll cut the other side. Okay, so I'll have growth there, uh, and it'll, it'll look okay. It'll, for about two years, it's gonna look kind of crappy, but then after that, I'll have hollies that I can, um, that I don't have to replace. Okay, so rejuvenation. Okay, this is where I want you to pick up your, your, um, your branch in front, and I want you to look and what we're going to try to identify is there's this thing called a branch, a branch bark ridge, okay? It looks like a little cut, okay? And it's, it's right at the joint of where, that's right. It looks like a bunch of trees in here. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> that's cool. I never thought of that. that. Okay, that branch bark ridge. Now, if you take... Your pencil, okay, at a 45 degree angle from that line, right there, 45 degrees, draw a line like this, okay? Yep, okay, French Park Bridge is, is literally that big. See, right there, it's right in the middle. Right across there. Right across there. And right here, see, that's what you Okay. Okay. This right here is called the collar. See that? That's the collar. So when you cut, you always want to cut out some of the Okay. Did everyone find the, the branch bark ridge? Okay. Now, when you prune, when you prune, you go to a 45 degree angle, and then there's this thing called a collar, okay? The collar. When you cut, you want to cut outside of the collar. It's gotta be on the outside of the collar. And I'm gonna show you a picture of that here in just a minute. Okay, see this, this area right here? What the collar does is it's, it's kinda like your eyeball, you know? And it's kinda like, it, it closes up. So if you cut inside that, you're gonna have a really bad wound. Yeah. It's gonna be let all the, the disease and everything else come in. But if you cut on the outside of that collar, 
what it does is it, it, it starts healing over. Okay, I'm going to show you some pictures of that here in just a minute. Okay. Okay, this again is Barber Fairs. These are, are absolutely wonderful documents. Um, it talks about pruning, when to prune. You can, it's got a list of types of trees. That it tells you what kind of cut you can do, when to do it. Um, uh, you know, for example, hydrangeas, if you, cut, if you cut hydrangeas now, if you prune them now, uh, you're going to prune the flowers off. So what I tell people is you prune the hydrangeas right after they bloom. That way you're not going to screw things up, okay? Uh, but it depends on what kind of hydrangea you have. You can look at that document, uh, how to prune specific plants, um, and it will tell you specifically when to prune that plant. Okay, I'm going to find, and here this is an example. This is the table that looks like. Uh, and down here is the key. It tells you when to prune. Um, it tells you what kind of function, uh, hedge, screen, specimens, uh, wildlife, topiary, uh, asperia, um, edibles, rain garden, grounding. It gives you all that information in just a simple table. Okay, when to prune, what types of pruning cuts to make. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the cuts themselves. So, again, the collar, see, this is that ridge bark ridge, okay? And then 45 degree angle from this line out to here, this is the collar, so it's gotta be outside the collar, okay? Okay, so here's the collar. Remember I told you it's kinda like your eyeball? It's closing down, it's, it's, it's creating a bark, uh, corky material to help protect the plant. Okay, we're going to talk about this, uh, this cut here in just a second. I want to show you this. Okay, last night, when I was cutting this last night, I said, I'm going to show them what happens if I don't do it right, because I'm in a hurry, okay? And I'm just going to go from top to bottom and cut this thing off. So I did that. I cut it, and what happened? Look how it damaged my tree, right? So I said, well, okay. Um, here's another example, okay? So we talk about cutting, and what you're trying to do is you're creating what's called a relief cut first. And so this, this, this one that I actually showed, I actually cut here at the bottom my first cut was down here, was below, okay? And then when I cut at the top, it broke, it broke, it broke to where I made that relief cut, right? Now, my final cut would be down here because now there's no weight up here now, so I can, can cut here without a problem and saw all the way through it. Over here was where I cut and I didn't have a relief cut and it stripped it all the way back to the, back to the, you know, down in the tree. It would still go. Okay, so that's why you do a three, three method cut. The first cut is here on the underside, okay? Then the top cut is further out. So that it breaks it, it breaks it, it splits down to here, and then you do your cleanup cut at that 45, here's the, uh, the, the ridge mark, okay? And then you make outside the collar 45 degrees out here. Yes, sir. Well, with a small one like that, you don't need to. If you've got hand, hand loppers, you know, um, or even a set of normal loppers, you know, you could cut that with a single cut like that. But, um, you know, this is, this is a good example of why I, I, I would use a saw uh, about this size and diameter. You know, if I could do this with a lopper, and, and I could because I'm strong enough, but some people are not. They need a, need a hand saw. Oh, thank you. Okay, so... Um, we're about ready for break. Okay, tell you what we're gonna do. As soon as we, we as soon as we come back on break, I'm gonna start showing you some tools. Okay, we'll take. That's the fun part. It get, gets people talking. So.